Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming on this lovely day. Um, it is our privilege tonight uh, to have as a speaker Professor Tim Flannery, um, who has joined the Graduate Institute as a Segre Foundation Distinguished Visiting Professors and a Visiting Fellow at the Center for International Environmental Studies to talk about pressing issues of climate change, technology, and essentially the future of the planet. So I'm very, very pleased that this room is so full. Um, I want to present special thanks by the Graduate Institute and our director, Philippe Burin, and the Center for International Environmental Studies um, to Monsieur uh, Segre and the Segre Foundation for making this possible, for bringing such a prominent scholar and speaker um, and ecologist um, and the policymaker to Geneva, to international Geneva, and allowing the graduate students and our students to take um, courses, a course with him, and as well as to benefit from uh, all the experience and knowledge that he brings here and he, he would share with us tonight. So, rather than go through the entire distinguished list of achievements of Professor Flaherty, I would start with the aspect of his bio that immediately caught my attention. In 2007, Professor Flaherty was named Australian of the Year in recognition of his effort to explain environmental issues and bring them to the attention of the public. How many professors are people of the year? This really speaks uh, to your many talents, Tim, and particularly this crucially important skill uh, to explain and to communicate environmental change and the significance of this change uh, to the public at large. Um, so, in addition to this global distinction, Professor Flannery um, has been a professorial fellow at the University of Melbourne. He was the chief commissioner of the Climate Commission of the Australian government, a body providing information on climate change. And importantly, in his training, he is a field zoologist who has discovered and named more than 30 new species of mammals, including two, three kangaroos, and still Australian of the Year. <laughs> so, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Professor Flaherty without further ado, and thank you for this opportunity to have an evening of a lecture and discussion. Thank you very much, Liliana, for that very generous introduction. And um, if I could, I'd just like to thank the Foundation Segre and Mr. Segre himself and all of the people that work there, as well as my colleagues in the Graduate Institute, uh, for such a tremendously warm welcome uh, here uh, to Geneva. I've, the time has just um, fled. I don't know where it's all gone to, but uh, I've had great fun teaching a course with some exceptionally bright and inquiring uh, students. Uh, interacting with colleagues and uh, learning a lot myself. So um, it's a great pleasure tonight to be able to give this, um, this lecture, this public lecture, which really covers much of the ground that I have been uh, covering in, in my course. Now, the one thing no one showed me was how to actually make this work. So I'm going to have to wing it a bit. Is this where we go? No, that's not where we go. Is it on this? No. Maybe, Liliana, you could just... Uh, is there a remote control? Uh, oh. There is... Um, yeah. oh, here we go. Thank you very much. Hidden away. Apologies. Is it working? Uh, yeah, it is, it's indeed. Good. Thank you very much. That's great. Good. Um, the story of climate change is, um, is not a new one. In fact, the origins of the science go back, arguably, to this man here, John Tyndall, an Irishman, who worked at the Royal Institution in London, demonstrating science for many years. And here is a machine he devised to use infrared radiation to assess the capacity of carbon dioxide to absorb heat energy. 
So very, very fundamental breakthrough made back then in 1859. Um, uh, Tyndall really uh, laid the foundations of climate science by showing that carbon dioxide in the air can capture heat and reflect it back to the earth, thereby warming our planet. He was a very interesting man, incidentally. He was very fond of Switzerland, uh, a keen alpinist. He was uh, among, in the first party ever to summit the Weisshorn and uh, one of the very first parties to summit the Matterhorn. Uh, lived uh, much of his life here in Switzerland, uh, despite the fact, uh, or the summers at least, that he, uh, he worked in London. A lot's happened in climate science that I'm not going to cover this evening uh, between Tyndall and where we are today in terms of understanding how the Earth system works. But I did just want to show this, this um, graphic, which demonstrates, I think, very clearly um, the human influence on Earth's climate system. You can see here a series of, of, of uh, graphics looking at temperature trends over the 20th century in different parts of our planet. And there's a purple band and a red band and a black line in each of those. The purple band is a computer simulation of what the temperature would have been in that location if it were not for the human influence of greenhouse gases being emitted in the atmosphere. So what the modelers have done there is taken every other influence we know about on the climate, from sunspots to, to the Milankovitch cycles that determine uh, the ice ages and so forth, uh, volcanic eruptions, everything else, and modelled what the temperature should have been like uh, without the human influence. And then there's the red band, which uh, is the same model which includes the human influence. So the, the red band uh, is the outcome of a, a climate model, historic climate model, looking at the 20th century, uh, which includes the human greenhouse gases. The black band, or the black line, is the actual observed measurements of temperature for that region. So you can see there very clearly that the, the actual measurements over the 20th century of the temperature um, correspond only with the red band, only with the modelling where the human influence is included. It's really quite convincing or powerful evidence that um, humans are now having an impact on our, on our planetary system, on our climate. So um, I'm happy to take questions about whether climate change is real or not or how strong the human influence is, uh, perhaps uh, in question time, but I don't want to waste too much time on that uh, particular aspect uh, at the moment. Um, Another way of looking at the human influence and how strong it is uh, was published earlier this year in February, in fact last month, um, and uh, a group of researchers had a look at the factors that are affecting our planet and affecting its, its climate, um, and you can see them laid out here. There's the, the, the astronomical forces, the geophysical forces, the internal dynamics, and for the last four billion years it's those forces which have determined the climate of our planet conditions uh, at the, on the surface of our planet. But over the last 40 years, a new factor has come into play, industrialised societies. And this Anthropocene equation um, basically tells you that the, the, this, the impact of industrial, industrialised societies is now very large indeed. It's driving climate change at a rate 170 times faster than the natural processes. So we are now a very, very significant element indeed in terms of our planet and its processes. Why is this all happening? It's happening in part because we are taking various elements, including carbon, from various parts of the earth and redistributing it. Um, one example of that is, is uh, the extraction of oil from the earth's crust. This rather beautiful um, artist's uh, piece of artwork uh, gives you a sense of how many barrels of oil are withdrawn or extracted from Earth's crust every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every year. And you can see that it's a vast volume. The graphic itself is quite interesting. The, guy, the artist who does this buys the different graphic elements from computer game stores, catalogues, and uses them in innovative ways to look at or try to explain to people the impact we're having on the planet. I find this quite powerful. You know, when you add that volume of carbon coming from the Earth's crust every second to the volume of coal that's coming out and the volume of gas, you get a sense of the vast scale at which we're rearranging the chemistry of our planet. 
So where is all of that fossil fuel um, going to? How are the greenhouse gases um, emitted? This is a little um, pie chart that shows you how much uh, buildings contribute, transport contributes, etc. The main figure that I want you really to take in here, though, is just that, that, central, that central number. I can't show from here. Um, just that 49 gigatons of um, carbon dioxide equivalent per year. It's a number so astronomical, so large, it's almost impossible to comprehend. One way of thinking about it, however, is that the, 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 that, that weight, that mass of material, is about the same as the mass of people on our planet doubled. So if you took every human being, every one of the 7.4 billion of us, uh, and doubled us, that is about the same volume as we're putting up every year in terms of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent into the atmosphere. So these are very, very large numbers that we're talking about. Who's responsible? Well, in a world where we're all linked with in trade, um, it, it pays uh, not to point the finger too precisely at different countries because China is the world's manufactory. We obviously get many goods uh, from China here. But you can see on this graphic that in terms of where the emissions come from, there's a couple of large producers. China and the US are right out there in front. There's then a series of countries that are uh, smaller volumes, Russia, India and so forth. But below that you get to a, a lot of countries that are producing only a little bit each. And you know, when you speak to people who don't really want to address the issue of climate change, I'll often say, look, why should Australia act on this? We're just a rounding error in the global, global tally. Uh, the truth is most of the world's 193 countries are rounding errors. And unless they work together to solve the problem, we will never be able to solve the problem. So even countries with relatively small emissions, like Australia at 1.5%, need to be part of the solution. I want to now turn to impacts, uh, uh, climate impacts around our planet, but particularly impacts on ecosystems. As Liliana mentioned, I'm a biologist by training. I've seen the damage climate change is doing uh, in my part of the world, in Australia and in Melanesia. And uh, I, I think we, we just don't consider often enough what an enormous impact our changing climate is having on the world's biodiversity. So a study published uh, last year has shown that, as this says, climate change impacts have now been documented across every ecosystem on Earth. We just need to think about that. Every ecosystem on Earth. Science has documented climate impacts. Very, very pervasive. And of course that's understandable because as our planet warms, we're altering the metabolism of the whole planet. As you alter the metabolism of anything, everything changes. Think of your own bodies. If we alter the metabolism of our own body, all of the, the relationships, the, the, the processes alter. And to do this on a large scale so at such a very rapid speed is having an impact. Among the most surprising and dismaying of those impacts really has been uh, the fate of the world's coral reefs. Um, Australia has the world's largest coral reef, the Great Barrier Reef. It's a place I'm very fond of. I've been there often to uh, look at the reef and see what's happening. And I can tell you that it's in really serious trouble. Last year we had a massive coral bleaching event that killed um, the northern third of the reef, or much, many corals on the northern third of the reef. This year we're seeing a second coral bleaching event, for the first time ever, two years in a row with a bleaching event. Before 1976, coral bleaching was entirely unknown. It had never happened. We saw a few events and then more and then more until this year we've had two in a row. Absolutely massive events, killing coral to depths of 40 metres or more. Uh, the impact on larger organisms on the reef is huge as well. The, the large fish are dying because they can't get enough oxygen in the warm water. Um, we've seen rising sea levels cause um, the destruction of turtle nesting sites. And we've seen the very first extinction of a mammal anywhere on Earth as a result of climate change on the Great Barrier Reef. The Bramble K. Melamies went extinct just over the last few years. So these are large-scale changes. Um, I think that unfortunately the, the Great Barrier Reef at least is doomed to extinction. I can't imagine a scenario where we can turn things around fast enough to save the Great Barrier Reef in the way it is. It's, it's, you know, the reef systems seem to be the most sensitive 
in all. And they're sensitive to the rate of change as much as the scale of change. They've survived huge climatic shifts in the past. Um, but this one is happening very, very quickly. And because the coral reef depends on a relationship between an algae and the coral polyp, um, that's a very sensitive, temperature sensitive one, um, it seems that the time is just too short to allow evolution to select for new strains of coral or new strains of algae that will keep the reef alive. Just as tragic is what, happen, is, what ha is happening to the world's alpine ecosystems. As you warm the planet, tree lines go up, yeah, because it's not so cold and the trees aren't killed uh, by the frost. These two animals here that you can see are tree kangaroos. These are two of the four species of tree kangaroos that I was fortunate enough to discover in New Guinea in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, the, the black and white one on the right lives above the tree line in the very high mountains of West Papua. It looks like a little panda and really behaves a bit like a panda. They're kind of slow, dopey, friendly animals. Very, very cute, but very sensitive to climatic shifts. The animal on the, on the, um, on the right, your right, the, the reddish animal, is uh, found on a very low mountain range in the north of New Guinea. So it occurs at lower elevation, but because the mountain range only rises to about 2,000 metres rather than nearly 5,000, like the main range, this animal is endangered as elevational rates change. And you can see here that the sad truth is that in New Guinea, tree lines rise by 300 metres per one degree of temperature increase. The same will be true for mountains all around the world, but, but in New Guinea it's been well studied. We've looked at birds and their distribution and we understand what's happening. At that rate of increase, um, by the end of this century, both of those species and probably 100 other mammal species will be gone if we let things continue at the rate that we are. There just isn't, none of the mountains are high enough to provide refuge uh, for these animals at that rate of increase if we're looking at three, four degrees temperature increase by, the, by 2100. Climate change is having impacts in, in very mundane, in mundane species as well. This basket of fish you could probably see sitting on a fish counter in any um, fish market in Europe. Um, but they're not the same fish that they were 40 years ago. Um, these eight commercial species that you see there, and they're listed, um, over a 40 year period um, have decreased in size um, uh, substantially. Uh, and that has coincided with a one to two degree Celsius increase in water temperature, which has resulted in a 23 dec uh, percent decrease in yield for those fish. So smaller fish, lower yields. Um, it's happening again uh, right through the oceans. And the, you might ask, why is it that the fish in the Great Barrier Reef are, are feeling these impacts so, so severely? You know, if you live in the water, you can't get away from extreme heat. We, fish can't sweat, right, because it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for you. It's only if you're on land that you sweat and you get cooler. So if you're in the oceans and if you're coral and can't move, then you have very few uh, options. Of course, climate change is affecting um, humans as well. In the Australian wine industry that I do some consulting with, we see that uh, the seasons are advanced by about a month. Sunburn is now a major issue for Australian grapes and people are making sunscreen for grapes, believe it or not, in Australia. Uh, we're also suffering increasingly from smoke taint in the grapes, which renders them uh, useless. And many varieties of grapes are no longer growing optimally where they were planted 40, 50 years ago. Global food security is also threatened. Um, I was astonished to read uh, on, at the front page of the China Daily last year, the headline, climate change threatens global food security, particularly food security in China. The reason for that is that our main crops, our grains, although they're growing a little bit faster as a result of the warm conditions and the extra CO2, are quickly losing their protein value. And by 2050, some project projections are that um, the, the protein uh, values will fall below a threshold uh, that will make us vulnerable to malnutrition. So all of that bad news, all of those impacts are bad news, but we, I want to turn now to some good news briefly before I give you a little bit more bad news and hopefully some more good news. But um, the great news was that 
um, in late 2015, we finally had a global agreement to deal with climate change. And can I uh, tell you, I, I was at the meeting, I was in awe of the French uh, uh, ability to broker that deal. Uh, Mr Fabius really was the hero of the day, in my opinion. I watched him take all sorts of abuse for many hours on end and yet come up with a, with a viable deal, which is a, a singular achievement. But the agreement came in late 2015 and greenhouse gases act slowly, so they have a big legacy issue. They, you know, the greenhouse gases we put into the air today won't reach their full warming potential for another 30 or so years. So it takes time for them to act. So scientists have framed a carbon budget. Um, and I just want to show you how that carbon budget's framed. It, it's very, very useful for us to understand uh, what we need to do, this budget approach. Um, you can see here a general visualisation of the carbon budget. We've got two sources. One is labelled geological reservoirs, and you can see that very big arrow going up there. That 9.3 figure, by the way, is carbon rather than carbon dioxide. It's one of the frustrations I have with different accounting approaches to this sort of thing, but people use the ca carbon rather than CO2 for the carbon budget. Um, so we need to multiply that figure by 3.66 for carbon dioxide because you've got a carbon atom and two large oxygen atoms. So there's a lot of about nearly 10 gigatons of carbon going up there, 36 gigatons of um, CO2 from fossil fuels, and then land use, so destruction of forests and so forth. We're getting about an extra gigaton going into the atmosphere, but thankfully we've got a bit coming out. We've got the ocean is taking 2.6 gigatons out. The land is taking 3.1 gigatons out. So if you take the minuses away from the pluses, you get that figure atmospheric growth. That's how much carbon stays in the atmosphere, about 4.5 gigatons per year. Oh, sorry, it's a bit of complicated accounting, but it's, it is uh, important to understand that about half the carbon that's emitted from various sources gets taken back in, the other half stays there. Before I go on to that, let me just say that this global carbon budget has been uh, described by the uh, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, and they make some assumptions in their modelling. They assume that this is a steady state approach, that there's no change in the land use sink or the, the ocean sink. And um, we'll, come, we'll come to that in a moment. But they also don't count the other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide on the basis they're offset by particulate pollution in Asia. And anyway, the carbon budget as framed by the IPCC tells us that we've got about 20 years left before we run out of carbon budget at current rates of use of fossil fuels. But some recent studies, um, one of which is still unpublished, and I quote from this as a, as a submitted paper, a paper submitted to Nature, um, uh, has, has really revised those figures. And one of the big revisions has come from uh, a question around whether these sinks, sorry, the land sink here and the ocean sink, whether they are in fact stable. And there is some very good evidence that they're not stable, that as the Earth warms, they're getting less capable of drawing carbon uh, back out of the atmosphere. And there's a series of figures here. I don't want you to look at this uh, in any great detail, but you can see relative weak weakening of land and ocean sinks, permafrost thawing, the dying of the Amazon forest, the dying of the forests across the northern part of our planet, and increased bacterial activity in the ocean are all adding carbon. Um, they're, they're adding carbon in um, to, to, the, to the, the ultimate figure. So what it's, it's, it's almost like having a, a bank account. Just say you've got $100 in the bank and you're very happy to have that there and that's going to last you a certain amount of time. But then you go to the bank and they say, oh, sorry, there's been some bank fees, you know, and you've only actually got $70 in the bank now because, you know, some of it's been chewed up by fees. That's a bit like what this does for the carbon budget. These changes in the sinks are taking away some of the budget we thought we had. And as I mentioned, CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. We have methane and nitrous oxide to account for. They represent about 17% um, of the total warming that happens. Um, and we can't assume that they're always going to be offset by this particulate pollution, because particulate pollution in 
China and India is killing people. It's, it's, it's the vis visible air pollution that we see there. And the Chinese government is working very hard to remove that pollution. So we can imagine in a year, in 10 years time or so, we may have to account for that in our carbon budget. And if we do that, we get some very, very bad news that in fact, we are already out of carbon budget. So if the sinks, the carbon sinks are weakening as we imagine, if the air quality in China and India improves as we hope it will, um, we are already in deficit. In fact, we went into carbon deficit within months of the Paris Agreement being signed. So that is difficult news. What that means is that we are committed to two degrees of warming, the dangerous threshold for climate change, and we're still adding lots of CO2, still adding carbon at the rate of 50 odd gigatons per year to the atmosphere. There is one hope in all of this though, which is the final line here I've put in bold, that this understanding requires negative emissions technologies to respect the CO2 guardrail. And that's what I came here to Switzerland to talk about, because I know the Swiss are very innovative people, highly technical people, and I've got some, had some students in my class that I think may take this uh, a little bit further. I should explain what these carbon negative technologies are. Let me put this down. My engagement with this area came as a result of these two men here, um, particularly Richard Branson. He called me in uh, 2007, said, I'm terribly worried about the climate problem. Um, I don't think people are going to make, are going to do enough. Um, I think we need to incentivise any possibility of getting some of the gas out of the air. Um, I thought he was being unduly sceptical at that point. I thought we were going to have a great outcome at Copenhagen. You know, I thought it was absolute laid down misere. But it turned out that Richard was in fact right. And um, we do need those carbon negative technologies. Thankfully, in 2007, he put up a prize of £25 million pounds, uh, to be awarded to any technology that can withdraw a gigaton or with the potential to withdraw a gigaton of carbon in any one year. I'm one of the judges on the panel, as is Al Gore, and um, I've seen, seen the 11,000 entries that have come through. I'm pretty familiar with the broad array of approaches. Um, of those 11,000, by the way, like, there's quite a few perpetual motion machines out there that, uh, that take about one second to look at, but there's also quite a number of really serious approaches. So essentially all of those 11,000 entries and all of the possibilities for drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere um, uh, uh, go into two pathways, the biological and the chemical. So let's have a look at the biological pathways. Reforestation, really simple. Plant trees, you draw CO2 out of the air, it's fantastic, really, really great outcome. And we all understand how to do it. Soil carbon. Again, we can store carbon in our soils by using different methods. We can make biochar and put it in the soils. We can change grazing regimes, protect our soils, all good, all good stuff. Or we can look at the oceans, seaweed farming. So we just hold on to those three approaches for a moment while we look at the chemical pathways. And they're very varied as well. There are certain rocks which, as they weather, draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. If we mine those rocks and distribute them in the oceans or on beaches, we can draw a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere. I'll come back to that one in a moment. But we can also now make carbon negative concretes. And that's great news because concrete manufacture is a major source of emissions. So we can make concrete that draws CO2 out of the air in the process. And we can make use direct air capture of carbon dioxide to make carbon fibres and so forth. And is just a few examples of the chemical pathways. But the big difference between the biological and chemical pathways is that in the biological pathways, the energy needed to capture the CO2 is free. It's just sunlight falling on plants. But the systems have their limits. For the chemical pathways, we have to supply the energy, and yet they have some particular advantages that we'll talk about as well. So just going back to tree planting, I, I really wish that we could solve the entire problem by planting trees. It would suit my temperament well. I love forests. Um, I think it would be a great thing to do. The problem is the scale. It's the scale of the issue we're dealing with. I mentioned that we were putting 50 gigatons in round figures of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. How many trees would we need to plant to withdraw one-tenth of that, just five gigatons per annum? It turns out that we need to cover the entire North American continent in forest over a 50-year period. 
um, at planting at the rate of about one Great Britain per year um, to, on average, draw that five-odd gigatons out of the atmosphere. And that exercise by itself would change the Earth's climate because all of those beautiful bright deserts and snow caps and things would be covered with dark forests. The Earth's albedo would change. We'd be absorbing more of the sun's energy rather than reflecting it back into space. So while forests and reforestation is going to be important, an important part of the approach, it's not going to be the solution. There is no one thing that's really the solution. But we have to understand how big the problem is and which technologies can offer how much of that solution. So I'm all for forests, but it's just not going to do it alone. Soil carbon is another fascinating area, relatively immature in terms of the science. This man here, Alan Savory, is one of the great proponents of soil carbon. Uh, that's a photograph of him taken when he was a soldier in the battle against Robert Mugabe in Rhodesia. He was a, a white, one of the uh, Europeans in Rhodesia who were fighting for their, uh, um, for their role there. Um, when he was doing this work, this um, fighting, he was a very careful observer of wildlife and he noticed that the wild animals moved around clumped together. They were fearful of predators and so forth and they ate everything in their path. So when he uh, finished that dismal part of his life, he uh, started to look at farming and realised that if, he clumped, if we could clump herbivores together, we can increase soil carbon by increasing uh, perennial grasses, for example, increasing the root mass there and increasing soil carbon in the humus sector. It's a, it's a really fantastic approach. It's used widely, but again, it's not going to be a big sector of the problem, the big section of the solution. It may be a gigaton or so, maybe a couple of gigatons, but... Um, there just isn't enough agricultural land and space, really, to, we think, between now and 2050 for it to be a much larger section than that. The oceans, however, are very different. Kelp farming is taking off globally. Um, the, the, the volume of, of seaweed farms is just growing astronomically. And kelp itself grows very fast. It grows 30 to 60 times faster than land-based plants. So, and that, of course, it's growing by drawing CO2 out of the... Out of the um, gases dissolved in the ocean. And I should just point out that the, the ocean is 500 times bigger than the atmosphere, right? So it's a relatively big organ of our planet. It's big enough that there is a whole atmosphere's worth of gases dissolved into the oceans. So um, as kelp grows in the oceans, it takes CO2 out of, that, out of, the, uh, out of the oceans. It buffers the acidity that we, we've seen as an increasing problem. In fact, around some of these seaweed farms in China, you get pHs on the order of 10 rather than 8.2. So uh, it's a very buffered environment. And there's also a hell of a lot of ocean on our planet. There's the uh, mid-Pacific. You can see there's hardly any land in sight there. And it's kind of, a lot of it's quite calm. Not a bad place to be growing uh, seaweed, perhaps. I just want to um, look at the scale of the potential solution here. Um, if we could grow kelp in the middle of our oceans, such as the Pacific Oceans, what could we achieve? Well, if we covered 9% of the ocean in seaweed farms, we could produce about 12 gigatons of methane a year to replace natural gas, um, storing 19 gigatons of CO2 with a further 34 gigatons to be captured. Um, that would give us 53 gigatons of CO2 per year that we could be capturing. Right? That, that would offset all of our current emissions. I thought that was fantastic news, but things even got better according to this study by Newt and others. You know, so we could also give a population of 10 billion people 200 kilograms of high quality fish food and shellfish food per year from those farms. And because the ocean's buffered, it's there an ideal environment for growing fish and shellfish. So I thought, great, problem solved. But then I uh, had a look at 9% of the world's oceans, and it turns out it's a fairly large area. It's about Four and a half times the size of Australia, my own country. And how many ocean-going kelp farms are there existing on the planet now? None. Absolutely none. There was a big move to develop them in the 1980s. The US Gas Roundtable put $2 billion into trying to develop them. Uh, flopped for various reasons. But there is renewed interest in this. And I think that in terms of offering a solution at scale, in terms of capture and storage, Mid-ocean kelp farms are important. The storage, of course, comes in because in the deep oceans, if you have kelp growing at the surface and you can get the kelp to sink to the bottom, 
um, that carbon is basically out of the system, out of the atmospheric system for a very long time, on the order of thousands of years. But we can't, we can't just use the deep sea as a dump. There is lots of life down there. Creatures like these, uh, octopus and squid. Um, and so the first step in trying to use that deep sea or use ocean farming of kelp as a solution, I think, has to be an R&D issue. It's looking at doing due, due diligence over what impact we might have in the deep ocean by dropping carbon by the gigaton uh, down into that area. So we're at the very early stages of this, but potentially kelp farming offers a real scalable solution uh, to the climate crisis as we face it today. There are other interesting options. Um, one researcher has suggested that we could put wind turbines in the Antarctic. He said it almost gets cold enough there to create dry ice for the CO2 to fall out of the air as dry ice. We just need to drop the temperature by a few tens of degrees and we could precipitate dry ice and bury it. How much wind energy would you need to do a gigaton of CO2 using that method? About half of the wind capacity currently installed in Germany, so not a lot. It's kind of doable, but it's like doing a project on Mars, yeah? It's a hard, hard environment, the Antarct Antarctic. But eventually, come 2050, as this climate crisis really starts to bite and we get to the pointy end of things, it may be that people who are young people today will want to use these options. So again, we need some R&D on the pluses and negatives of uh, capturing um, CO2 by precipitating it out of the atmosphere through freezing. Carbon negative concretes I mentioned earlier. Um, these building blocks are carbon negative uh, ones. They're, they're, they sequester about 14 kilograms of carbon for every tonne of block manufactured. There are other uh, concretes as well that can be used that um, do a similar thing. So that's important because um, concretes are about, they are responsible for about 5% of current global emissions. So if you turn it from a big source of emissions to a source of um, uh, reductions, that is a big positive. Silicate rocks I mentioned earlier, here is what some of those silicate rocks look like, they're little green grains. Um, we, we know that they absorb CO2 and there's a series of scientific papers over the years that have been published which point to the theoretical possibility of, of doing this. But a major paper was published uh, just um, last year, late last year, which really pointed out the scale at which these, these uh, rocks could be used. And this is James Hansen, a very famous client, climate scientist from the US, um, talking about uh, the, the, how these rocks would need to be used at a fairly high rate, but that we could reduce CO2 by between 30 and 300 parts per million by 2100. I mean, that's a massively scalable thing. Given that you've got to draw down 18 gigatons of CO2 to reduce atmospheric concentrations by one part per million. Um, the problem with this solution, as I see it today, is that how do we dig up rocks and grind them up now? We burn fossil fuels to do that, yeah? So until we can clean the electricity and transport sectors up, this isn't going to be a scalable solution. Once we achieve that, this could well be. Uh, a very important part of our response in the years to come. Direct air capture of CO2 uh, is happening now. You've got a great company in Switzerland already who is doing this. It's very efficient. A small machine can capture CO2 at the same, um, or the same amount of CO2 a thousand hectares of forest can. So very, very efficient um, uh, practices. That CO2 can be used for all sorts of purposes. Um, we can make plastics with it. We can make energy with it. Um, and possibly, as I'll come to, uh, carbon fibre. So bioplastics already exist. They're already used for a number of purposes. Um, the faster we can grow this industry and the more we can tie it to the capturing of atmospheric CO2 to do this, the better off we'll be. So instead of using fossil fuels for all of these purposes, we can use the problem itself, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere itself. It's never going to be scalable. Um, at the gigaton scale, we'd have to use about, I think, five times as many plastic bags as we do today, and they'd all have to be made from um, atmospheric CO2 uh, to get to the gigaton scale. And we don't want to use plastic bags for obvious reasons. So, um, But it'll be perhaps a small part of the solution. Um, furniture, uh, various plastics, coatings, and so forth. 
A major breakthrough was announced in 2015 by this man here, um, uh, Professor Licht from George Washington University. He devised a way of precipitating carbon fibre directly out of the atmosphere using a very specialised form of concentrated solar thermal technology. So producing very high heat and using that uh, to precipitate these carbon fibres you can see on the side here. Why is this such a big breakthrough? Um, first of all, Professor Licht claimed that his technology allowed us to generate CO2 uh, at a lower cost than that of current production methods, which if that's anywhere near true is astonishing. But secondly, carbon fibre is a very important material for our future. It's the, it's the lightest, strongest material we know of. It can compete head on with aluminium and steel, both major sources of emissions, if we can produce it cheaply enough. So these new technologies, I think, are potentially very important indeed. Finally, atmospheric, uh, finally artificial photosynthesis. I'm both exhilarated and terrified by this, this particular approach. Um, people are finding new photosynthetic pathways. This one here that was announced uh, just four months ago uh, using uh, engineered enzymes is five times more efficient than existing pathways. What really terrifies me about this is that if it ever gets into an organism. You know, imagine having a little bacteria that can photosynthesize five times more efficiently uh, than a plant. There'll be no life on Earth and no higher life on Earth anyway once that happens because these, presumably these very efficient organisms uh, will be able to use up all of the CO2. And yet you can't unlock artificial photosynthesis at scale without making it in vivo, without putting it in life. So we're experimenting here with some of the very fundamental aspects of Earth's regulation and there are clearly needs uh, for, for regulation and caution, I would say. I just want to follow up um, with some thoughts about 2050. We often target, 2050 is the target for us quite often in terms of um, atmospheric concentrations of CO2, the need for complete decarbonisation, the need to bring negative carbon technologies or negative, uh, uh, yeah, negative carbon technologies to scale. And it often seems so far away that it's either we see it in science fiction terms or we see it in in, in terms of today. And I don't think either of those approaches is really right. Um, you know, 2050 is only 33 years away, and one way of thinking about it is to look back at, well, 1917 instead of 2017, and to think about 20, at 1950. What was it like? So there's London in 1917. Lots of horse-drawn transport. Guys going off to fight in a war where tanks hadn't even entered the battlefield yet as of this time of 19, 1917. Um, they'd probably just got out of school, those kids who joined the army, and they were taught from maps like this, you know. This was the, the kind of um, eternal truth of the, of the 19th and early 20th century. The great empires, European empires, put their imprint on the world map and seemed that they'd never go away. There's not a single communist country on the map. The October Revolution hadn't happened in March 1917, uh, so all of that's yet to come, but the empires would be there. There's Geneva, 1950. Really dramatic difference from 1917. Um, jet aircraft in 1950. So if you were a kid in a school or a soldier in 1917 and someone told you about these jet aircraft that would be there to carry you around in, when you'd reached your maturity, would you have thought that was credible? I don't think so. Um, electrification of the home, you know, the home that you would have left to go to school in 1917 would have been entirely mum powered probably, unless you had servants, you know, all of the washing and cooking and everything was done, you know, a lot of it by hand. It, electrification hadn't really penetrated the home. By 1950, it's everywhere. And of course, nuclear weapons. Now Einstein had written his theory of relativity unlocking the possibility of nuclear weapons um, before 1917. But if you'd told someone in 1917 that this was the future of weaponry, I don't think you would have been believed. So my message really is that 2050 is largely unimaginable to us. When we talk about carbon negative technologies drawing gigatons of CO2 out of the air, it seems impossible from today's perspective because the industries are still in embryo. They're still very, very tiny. But I am convinced that the, the pace of technological change this century dwarfs that of last century. I think that we limit us, we self-limit because we don't allow our imagination 
to engage in the possibilities that might become realities um, in the next 33 years. Uh, that's the end of my talk. I've taken all of my time and I'm happy now to take questions. Thank you very much. Tim, thank you so much for this fascinating survey of uh, what the future might look or not. Um, and now, without further delays, I would like to invite questions. Yes. There is indeed. You want to sit? And... Uh, I can stay. It's probably yeah. easier to stay okay. up here. Yeah. Thank um, so thank you for your presentation. And I am an international law student from Italy, currently writing her dissertation on climate change and Paris Agreement. And so since you have mentioned the subject, I would like to ask you, what's your opinion on, on the Paris Agreement? Do you think it will, um, I think it's too late perhaps to imagine we will have the planet we inherited mm. by our ancestors, but do you think it will help the international community to react to uh, climate change? Yes, look, I think that the Paris Agreement is a real landmark in that for the first time we've had a global political agreement to act. We know the actions aren't strong enough to get us where we need to go to, but there are also mechanisms built into the agreement that allow us to deepen our commitment over time. Um, the message that that sends to business is particularly important because you know, those, those actions will include all sorts of mechanisms, whether they be carbon price or whatever else, um, which, are, which, which business then has to take into account as it, as it um, invests in future infrastructure. Um, so I do think it's important, but I really recognise that it's come very late, much later than we would have liked. It would have been great if the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 had come to an agreement because we'd have a very small problem today compared with what we have, probably if that had happened. Um, and I would have been very happy if the, if the Paris meeting or some future meeting takes a serious look at these carbon negative technologies because we now know we can't get by without them. Thank you very much for the talk, Professor. My name is Defne Gönanç. I'm a PhD student at the Institute. I wondered uh, your perception about uh, the extent to which we can solve the climate problem relying on techn new technologies mm. and without actually um, changing our consumption patterns and, of course, ultimately the production patterns. Mm. And to what extent we can believe in states um, to come up with a solution to change our production patterns? Yeah. Well, they're, they're great questions. and. Um, they bring up a number of ethical issues. I mean, we all know that we consume too much in the developed countries and that those in developing countries need a chance to increase their, their quality of life as well. Um, I think they're really complex moral, moral issues. And um, in some ways, I mean, I'm a, I'm a scientist, so I tend to concentrate on the technologies. I'm not saying that those other issues are, are not important. I think they are. But they probably need to be addressed in a, by a different, a different person. So, you know, I would love to see us increase efficiency, um, consume less and move to cleaner technologies. But I, I guess my area of expertise is more in that, those cleaner technologies than those other, how you achieve those other ends. Yeah. Yes, uh, good evening, Mr. Flannery. Uh, David Rocha, I'm heading a circular economy consulting firm here mm -hmm. based in Geneva. Uh, what is, according to you, the main barrier for large-scale market development of carbon-negative uh, technologies? Because if you give value to the, the, the product, will the market at one point take care of it itself when carbon, uh, fossil fuel prices eventually go up? Yeah. Or do you need global framework agreements like Kyoto or so on for this to happen? Yeah, that, that's, another, that's another great question. And uh, I think the basket of technologies is so broad that there's going to be different answers for different parts. I suspect that the um, things like the uh, carbon fibre breakthrough may be self-propelling. It may be that they, um, if the cost structure is as portrayed, that the private investment will take that to scale uh, in due course. Um, and it may be that as fossil fuels decline in use, that um, we will uh, find it cost effective to use CO2 um, for plastics production or fertiliser production. It's already reasonably close for fertiliser production to use clean energy, for example. 
for that rather than um, uh, fossil fuels. But there are some large-scale um, approaches which I think will always need some sort of carbon price or a, a, some payment for getting rid of carbon. So if you take um, kelp farming in the mid-ocean is a good example. Um, kelp farming is a very profitable business, clearly. It's, it's growing hugely. It's providing lots of high-quality protein already. But all of the kelp farming that's being done at the moment is in near-shore environments because it's close to markets and close to services and so forth. To take that offshore into the oceans is going to involve a cost. Now, how do we ever get that cost paid? Because it's only in the oceans that you can sequester the carbon. So all the kelp farming on the coast doesn't take carbon out of the system. So I think that there's probably going to need to be a, a, a price or premium paid for, for disposal of that carbon eventually. Um, and of course, the silicate rocks are a bit the same. We could use silicate rocks to enrich beaches and so forth, but to do it at the scale the researchers are talking about, you need to pay for that somehow. So there's going to have to be some payment system, I think, for some of the larger scale uh, options. Uh, in the New York Times on Friday, uh, there was an article written by Johan Rockström, I think, who was one yes. of the people that you yeah. noted. Yeah. And he's suggesting, now you didn't talk about reducing emissions, but he's suggesting that by developing a, a corollary to Moore's law, which says that computing power doubles every 24 months, a carbon law simply states that the world must have emissions every decade to stand a chance of reaching a stable climate system for the planet. He's suggesting in this article that we could do that by 2050. Yeah. I'm just curious about your opinion about this. It's quite optimistic. I think so. And I, I, looked, I had a look at the, the paper behind that, this um, uh, methodology for, for decarbonising. And um, I think it's likely to be much more messy in the real world than that. Um, what we have on our side at the moment is that there's a global agreement for action and the cost reductions in two of the most prominent clean technologies, wind and solar, have been very substantial. So now we're seeing uh, solar and wind cost competitive with fossil fuels. So in a place like Australia, 100% of our new build in energy is renewables because it's just cheaper, you know, it's, it, it, it's better. So that's happened. Part of the problem, though, is that the existing fleet of, um, of, of coal-fired power plants, just to take an example, um, we, need, we know we need to retire them early, and yet you know, the costs have been sunk into those, those uh, fleets, and they're, they're very cheap to continue running. So unless there are some big changes in the electricity market, it's likely that the, those things will continue polluting for many decades to come. I do a little bit of work with Tata Power in India, the biggest privately owned energy company in India, and they uh, recently took over a 4.5 um, mega, uh, sorry, 4,500 megawatt coal-fired power plants that had only been completed in 2012. So, you know, there are issues there. So I, from where I stand at the moment, I can see that we're not going to build a lot more fossil fuel, in, uh, fossil fuel plants in energy, but we need to retire some of the old ones aggressively in order to do what Rockstrom's talking about doing. And we don't have a mechanism for doing that at the moment. Um, in transport, I, I just wish um, Elon Musk all the best. I hope he does it, I hope he meets his targets, you know. But half a million electric vehicles by 2018, and he did 88,000 last year, is a big stretch. So we shall see. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Moira Fall, I'm Head of Research at the Public-Private Partnerships Centre at the University of Geneva. My first question is, have you seen any either positive or negative examples of public-private partnerships in this particular area? And my second question is about um, something that Liliana referred to earlier. Right now you're probably talking to an audience of the converted, mm -hmm. and it's quite easy to talk to people who agree with you. We all do it all the time. Um, so my question is, what, um, what kinds of things have you found in your experience that have helped when you're speaking to people who don't really already agree with you on this? Thank you. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great question. In terms of private-public partnerships, um, I'm, I'm struggling to think of any in this carbon-negative space. It's such a new space that um, I, I can't point to any uh, offhand. Um, in terms of talking to people who agree with you, the, 
it's, it's very interesting when you start talking about these carbon negative technologies. One of the reasons I think that they haven't been part of the discussion so far is that many people who are concerned about climate change have been quite rightly concerned that the waters will get muddied if we talk about this and we get the focus away from reducing the need for fossil fuel, you know, burning of fossil fuels. And so in the lead up to Paris, people were saying, don't, don't publicise this stuff because, you know, the fossil fuel industry will see it as a get out of jail free card. Now, my argument and those who are involved with this is very clear, we have to do both. We're now at a crossroads where we must do both. But I think this, these arguments are still rather palatable to some of the um, polluting industries or even right-wing governments who don't necessarily want to address uh, carbon emissions as strongly as we'd like them to, but who may see uh, advantages for themselves in, in terms of developing and pursuing some of these technologies. So if you're a, a big importer of, of steel, for example, or big user of aluminium, you may find that you know, if you can get your primary building products out of the air by using you know, a CST technology, that's a big advantage. You know? Um, so I, I think that it may be, it may, the message may, it may reach a slightly different audience to that for the emissions reductions. Even though I say we clearly say that both need to be done, I hope that um, that we can find some allies in developing, in, in you know, doing the the basic R and D that's required at least for this. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Flannery. My name is James Hardcastle. I work with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, based here. Um, you're, the title of it's a really interesting presentation, lots of notes. Uh, the title is The Governed Planet, mm -hmm. and actually the planet isn't really governed That's very right. well. Um, the, the Paris Agreement, you know, in that context is pretty amazing. It's a good, good basis. Yeah. But how do you think some of these technologies, you mentioned the photosynthesis and mm -hmm. all these other things, how are we going to govern or manage who develops what and when and how? Yeah, and is the current framework enough? That's a thank you. Because I was hoping this might come up in question time. I didn't really want to preempt um, <clears throat> which direction it'd take. Look, I called the talk the Governed Planet because, at the moment, um, with emissions growth the way it is, um, we are obviously in, embarked upon an uncontrolled experiment. The carbon negative technologies, however, give you some choices. You saw the range of possibilities for the silicate rocks from 30 to 300 parts per million. You know. And what that begs really is for humanity to set the thermostat. You know, We can collectively, we may, do we want to do it haphazardly again? Do we want to just sort of approximate on this? Do we want to actually have an, an objective, uh, an agreement? Because we can't go back, well, it will be very difficult to go back to 280 parts per million to the pre-industrial levels. It, it may be that we will need to agree that we will aim for 300 or 350 parts per million, whatever it may be. But there's, that I think is an inev inevitability for humans. It seems impossible from where we stand today, having just had the agony of brokering an agreement on climate change, which has taken 21 years to get to. But nevertheless, that I don't think we can dodge that question anymore. Um, and you're quite right that we're now starting to tinker with some of the really fundamental underpinnings of life on Earth. When you start dealing with, you know, engineering photosynthesis, you're doing something very substantial. So how do we regulate that? How do we um, regulate geoengineering, which I haven't touched on here, so you know, the putting of sulphates up into the, the atmosphere uh, to, to, to lower temperatures, you know, which I consider very dangerous, uh, dangerous things that shouldn't be done. But they're cheap. Uh, uh, and they're instantly effective. So if you're a China which is going into some sort of meltdown as a result of climate change, you may be tempted to use that. So how do we, how do we develop those protocols and understandings and agreements that keep us on this rather crooked and narrow road to carbon reductions rather than take the very broad open road to uh, geoengineering or catastrophic uh, interventions? It's a great question. Bonjour. Uh, my name is Daniel Ruskart. I'm a research associate at the University of Liège and Toulouse. But the issue, has two issues. I read your book, Future Eater, and I, I was fascinating. It's just take it, you know, 
but for me, it's uh, so interesting to see that basically human beings, Aboriginal peoples, could not even find a solution, and basically, at the end, they drive everything to extension when mm -hmm. they just knew their environment. And my first question was, obviously, do you think, knowing your history, there is really some hopes, or you know, you, I don't find you very critical. Looks at through technology, what's your real assessment of the situation? And the uh, second, uh, is a bit issue, a bit more sensitive, uh, as you are an ecologist, uh, and you know quite a lot of things, but coming from a uh, peace and, and um, mm -hmm. this issue that when people grow and, and develop, uh, they become a bit global expert, and yeah. then they talk about a bit everything. Uh, and mm -hmm. suddenly, ecologist becomes, uh, don't take it negative, but climate expert, and in fact, climate is linked to economy, political mm -hmm. discussion, and therefore, how do you feel comfortable and how do you feel that you need to be supported to get your point across? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, no good. Um, I think the, the, the question of whether we will pull back from this edge of destruction or not is, and I can't, I can't answer the will we or not because we can't see the future, but I can answer to, a, to, extent, to some extent, can we? And I think we can, I mean, my best estimate for uh, reductions in, in atmospheric CO2 using a basket of third-way technologies by 2050 was about 16 gigatons of, 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 of um, CO2 per year. So, you know, on the order of 40% of, of uh, you know, current emissions, which is a very big contribution. So, you know, and that's probably maybe conservative, maybe that's my current day thinking rather than the possibility of what 2050 might bring. But I think we can, if we want, um, set the thermostat. We can, you know, it's within our technical grasp to do that. Um, in terms of, in terms of um, support for climate science, I think at the moment what I'm, what I'm trying to do is just create awareness of these carbon negative technologies because they haven't really been on the radar to any extent previously, and particularly taking the opportunity of speaking to young people in places like the Graduate Institute, who may see careers for themselves, whether you know, whether you're a, a diplomat or a business person or whatever it is, uh, you know, um, understanding the importance of these and building them into what you're doing could be very, very important. I particularly enjoy speaking to engineers. I know there's not many of those here, but you get some young engineers around these problems, and they really become very energised and start thinking in different ways. So um, it's a long, slow process. We've just, you know, I, I was uh, chaired the Copenhagen Climate Council in 2009 and saw that whole process fall apart and I was involved with climate change before that and then was climate commissioner and was sacked by a right-wing government that didn't want to deal with it. And the one thing you know uh, through that is you've just got to stick with it, huh? Just got to, just, it's like being a game of rugby. If you've got the ball, you just have to keep pushing towards the try line, right? No matter what anyone does. So. Oh, Psst, I, I have a mic. <laughs> what should I do with it? <laughs> Hello, my, uh, my name is Astrid Sonneville. Uh, I'm an independent... Um, I'm an engineer, by the way. I'm not young anymore, maybe, but I'm an engineer. Um, uh, I have a few remarks and a few questions. The, the first thing is you took a comparison between 1917 and 1950, yes. which is very good. But if you would have taken one between 1984 mm -hmm. and 2017 the rate of change would have been exponential, yes. much further. Yeah. So it's just a, a train of thinking, and that's where we are now. Yeah. So I think we're much on a much faster pace of change than what we saw in the yeah. start of the last century. The, the other uh, question is, as I hear you, you answer the questions, and also from the talk, my conclusion is, technology is there or on the horizon to fix this issue, be it reduction, be it carbon capture. Uh, so the issue is not a technological one. Yes, we have to continue to do all the research and due diligence, all of that. The issue is something else. Mm -hmm. So the issue for me is a political one, a human one, whatever you want to call it. This is decision-making one. So how, how can we, other than in democracy where we can vote for green parties or people who lead this era, what else can we do as citizens, as engineers, as leaders to drive it in the right direction, because that's even more freaking me out. Like, we know yeah. what to do, and we don't do it. That, 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 that really, that drives me really nuts. Because if we didn't know how to do it, 
that would be still acceptable. This is just sheer nonsense that we don't fix a problem that we know how to fix. So, so what would be your advice to, uh, to people in the room and to myself in specific? No, if I could answer that question, I'd die a happy man. I just don't know. <laughs> it's, it's the great question, isn't it? How do we, as a species, make decisions? Um, you know, the, the, I suppose all I can uh, point to is, is, is a trend of us becoming interconnected, as I showed on my final slide, that we are now becoming interconnected in a way that we weren't 50 or even 30 years ago. And that enables new ways of decision making, possibly. I don't think any of us can see what the future of democracy is going to be today. But what we can all see is that the current democratic models are under stress. Yeah. So something new will emerge, I, I, I think. I don't know what it's going to be. But I suspect that the level of interconnectivity now and um, the power of the individual, the changing power of the individual, will something new will emerge. I mean, I, you know, coming here to Switzerland, I, I've learned a lot. I mean, the democratic process here is fundamentally different from what it is in Australia, and a lot more promising. The, you know, the level of engagement of individuals in the process is really heartening, you know, and, and that's, I think, maybe a little bit more of that would be a good start, at least. Hi. Uh, yes, thanks for your presentation. I would be interested in asking, what's your opinion on nuclear energy production? Because there are countries such as China that are investing quite a lot in new nuclear energy yeah, plants. Right. And it seems to be a carbon-free production of energy, at least. Yeah. So what's your take on that? Thanks. Well, I think you know, every form of energy production has its upsides and its downsides. And nuclear has some rather spectacularly large downsides, but it hasn't stopped it being used. Um, I just, you know, if you look at the trajectory of, or look at, where our energy is coming from. The percentage of global energy needs coming from nuclear is declining over time. And that's partly a political thing that, you know, the nations have turned against it. It's also, though, an economic issue. You know, nuclear power plants are very, very big. They're, you know, minimum 2,000 megawatts. Uh, they're very long in the planning and very long in the payback. So it'd be 50 years they've got to run. You know, a coal plant might go for almost 50, a gas plant for 30 wind turbines and solar panels, 25. And the, the nuclear isn't really scalable. It's, you know, 2,000 megawatts or not at all, really. And, and so you might tie up 10 or $15 billion for, you know, all of that period, for very long periods with long planning. And so <clears throat> capital isn't flowing uh, to nuclear. Where you see it being built is where government is guaranteeing uh, an electricity price into the future and also assuming the risks. So places like China, it's happening. But elsewhere, it's not really growing. Your capital's flowing into the cheapest um, and, and most modular form of energy generation, which is wind and solar. Uh, I just want to pick up a few questions from students here. Thank you. Uh, what is your opinion on Donald, Trump, uh, Donald Trump's decision to renew coal mining and energy, and how will this affect uh, climate change in the future? God. Um, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't. <clears throat> it took some time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, look, I, personally, I'm not that worried. I think if he can, if he can um, revive coal mining and the man's a miracle worker. I mean, you know, only God could revise, Jesus could revive Lazarus, so I don't know. I don't, I don't, know. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but he can slow down uh, action on climate change, you know, and uh, we've seen the XL pipeline agreement. Um, now, that pipeline may never be built. Maybe the economics are against it. But he can also uh, take away all of the EPA regulation around coal, so giving a longer life to some of those antique plants that are so polluting now. So the mercury legislation might reverse that. You know, um, We'll just have to see. But I think it really is just kind of soothing the dying pillow of an industry rather than anything else, I hope. I'm, I, I look, I, again, with all things, every time I open my mouth about politics, I'm proven wrong, so probably this might not be an exception. But you know, I hope that's how it'll look. Thanks. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Flannery. We talked a lot during the whole semester, but last time, the, during the last class we've been having, we, we kind of uh, stopped over the, the comparison between North days and the, the days before the First World War. Mm. And we moved on to uh, Papua New Guinea, of course. But yeah. uh, my question is, this comparison, like, uh, uh, well, coming from social science background, what I see is that science is not really equal. It's not really to be equal with technology. Sometimes it takes years, decades for science to be really applied. Yeah. What we have been seeing here is lab, lab, laboratory science. And my question is, um, well, in, in fact, the people before the First World War, they kind of knew all the technology we have today, except nuclear technology and genetic engineering. And uh, in, in 1914, people still believe that the world is going to be all over by Christmas. Oh, I'm mean saying it's like that period, well, philosophically, the philosophers coming from postmodernist um, theory would point out that uh, um, technology is sometimes the major leap we have in history with technology happened to correlate with wars. I mean, with yeah. catastrophes, and uh, because politics lack the will, the willingness to push forward technology. Yeah. I would like to know your opinion on that. Well, I think it's, it's possibly true. I mean, you know, the seeds of 1950 were already in existence in 1917. If you'd known where to look, huh? you could have gone to Einstein's theory on relativity. You could have read Karl Marx's Das Kapital and known there was a revolution uh, coming along that changed that old world map. Um, so I guess I guess it's true that the, you know often technologies are in, envisioned long before they are developed. Um, I think in the case of the carbon negative technologies, you're quite right to say many of them are laptop, their desktop or their their, their laptop, their their laboratory top, or very early scale. And to, for any of them to get to the gigaton scale, you're looking at decades of development. You know, it's not going to happen quickly. It'll be like wind and solar. You know, in the 1970s, they were very small scale. It, it took 40 years for them to get to scale, gigawatt scale. So you're quite right to suggest that. Um, whether we need a war to in incentivise that action, I don't know. I, 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 sus I would hope that the, 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 the urgency of the climate issue would incentivise the thing, but you're quite right to ask. Uh, hello, I'm a student from Neustadt Junior College uh, here to come see you. Thank you very much for the uh, speech. And I'd just like uh, to ask very quickly, if you were to be able to put in charge of just the world, what would be, um, what would be not only the direction that, because there's been a lot of talk of what technology and the different perspectives of, of how to, to tackle this issue, but what would the one direction that you would take and what would, in that direction, the one technology if, uh, that you would use. And just a small little follow-up. Uh, as someone who is very passionate about water as an issue, uh, and since we had the talk about war, do you believe the next war could possibly be fought over water? Thank you. Wow, God, what a question to go out on. That's a, they're huge. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my God. Look, I, I, the one thing I know is that if, if it was just up to me and I picked a technology, I'd almost be certain to be wrong. You know, the world is a surprising place and it's very hard to get it right. But it, from where I sit today, the one that I would look at is, is mid-ocean kelp farming because it gives you the scale and also solves the problem of feeding the planet, you know. So um, <clears throat> that's where my instincts would, t would tend to lead, to, to be one of great interest. Um, and you, your question then was about was whether the next war will be over water. Wow, well... I'm not sure. I mean, I come from a very dry continent, and there's lots of mini wars fought over water, you know, between farmers and, and so forth. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you know, when you, can, I, can I answer by just pointing out one more technological innovation? There's a really fantastic tomato farm in Australia in the middle of the desert. It's called Sundrop Farms. Just Google it and have a look. But they grow 10% of Australia's tomato crop without using a drop of fresh water or an ounce of fossil fuels. And they're in the middle of the desert. So what they're doing is using concentrated solar thermal technology to distill seawater, to irrigate the crop. It's all enclosed, all controlled, pest controlled. 
It's a fantastic operation, and they grow the stuff cheaper than a farmer can grow it in the open field. You know, so when you talk about a war of, of water, that what that what that technology potentially does is to say anywhere that you've got a desert with lots of sunlight and some salt water, you can grow lots of food. You know, so I don't know. I think I think the world of the future is going to be different from the world of today. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Good evening, uh, Derek Quenser de Stokalpa. Thank you so much for this uh, highly informative and uh, hopeful, hopefully, um, presentation. What I wanted to talk about was really the um, socio-economic um, innovation and technology, and actually the basic uh, technologies, of course, monetary systems. And uh, this is driving not only behavior of agents, you, me, and whoever is consuming, but also the way uh, resources are being allocated. And I was wondering if you have come across in the last couple of years some innovation that could maybe drive a more efficient allocation of resources and maybe new types of behavior of us economic agents. That's another very big question. I've never been asked that before, so it's a, I need to think about that. Um, do you know, I'm... I, I'm no expert on economic systems, so I watch with a sort of a naive eye some of this stuff. But I've seen some quite good innovations, I think, in my own country of Australia. Our, our government set up a, effectively a green bank, a $10 billion green bank. And the rules of that bank were they were able to lend money um, at a very competitive rate to businesses um, if they could demonstrate that they would reduce carbon pollution by 30% or more beyond the basket average in their particular industry. So that, that's where this Sundrop Farms came from, was from initial funding through that bank, but then it was taken over by commercial interest because it was just so prospective. So I think that sort of thing is, 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 at least locally for us in Australia, has been very good. And so maybe that green bank approach would be something that would fall into that category. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you are the person of the year or whatever, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for this fascinating journey. I have about 10 questions, but unfortunately for everybody else, I cannot abuse the power of the of the chair, um, but I would like to thank you again for this fantastic opportunity to rethink our options and to start thinking more creatively in terms of innovation and linking different approaches to climate change. And I thank the Segre Foundation, Mr. Claudio Segre, who is here for bringing that opportunity to the Graduate Institute, which is really a place about thinking and pushing across uh, over the walls and across the standard solution. And what was particularly fascinating, that many of these options were created almost in a clandestine manner. A single scientist here, a lab there, a set of scientists over there. And now really the challenges is how to navigate about these potential solutions together with other potential solutions, such as consumption, such as efficiency, such as reducing uh, cons uh, the use of fossil fuels and gaining from that. So really, we are very, very grateful as an institution to have the opportunity for this thought-provoking lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you.